Why does enterprise software often make our lives at work harder instead of easier? It's a big question. That's why my guest this week is Naomi Teitelman. She is a talent strategist for the new world of work and an award-winning HR executive who focuses on employee and customer experience both are important. Her collaborative leadership advisory is collaborativity, and she has her own podcast. We'll link it in the comments, Foresight. I cannot wait for this conversation. But first, welcome to this week's episode of Make Sense. It's a video podcast that simplifies complex issues at the intersection of tech and people. There are a lot of them. So whether you're totally hyped on artificial intelligence and ready for the robot takeover, or you wanna crawl into a cave after deleting all of your social media accounts, I feel you. I'm here with my guests to help make sense of what's going on so you can design yourself into the future. My name is Lindsay Tabus. I'm a product market fit strategist, innovation consultant, and venture fundraising advisor. If you're new here, subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So let's make sense of enterprise software's impact on the employee experience. Naomi, where are you today? Toronto? How are you? Ah, so good to be here with you today. I'm here in sunny, hot Toronto. I don't think as hot as Philadelphia, but it's quite sunny and warm and it's been a great summer so glad to be joining you from here yeah i'm super excited to have a guest on that also has their own podcast uh you know it's just good to to, you know you're comfortable you're you're good here and that's awesome so let's start with our first segment crystal ball what does the future hold this is where I call out interesting predictions for this year and the experts, my guests, they tell us their hot take. So I'm going to rapid fire headlines and Naomi, I want you to say like, yes, that's happening. Yes, I want that to happen or no, please no, or no, that's not happening. Okay. Sounds awesome. good. So I think, I think these are, are going to be totally in your wheelhouse and I know you're going to do awesome. So. I'm going to start with the really hot topic out in the media and on Make Sense because I want to see where you stand. Uh, The headline is, or the prediction is, artificial intelligence will not replace you, but a person using it will. Mm, That's great. So that talks both about kind of the bot strategy that we have in our organizations, as well as the skills that are going to be needed for the future. Um, so I would say I am, I think that that will happen to a certain extent. Um, I'm fully on board with AI is not going to replace humans. It's going to, you know, continue to automate even more and more, not just mundane tasks, but actually those analytical tasks as well are starting to be automated, but that never replaces the need for humans. That being said, everybody will need to be at least digitally savvy and digitally literate in the future. We'll need to know how to interact with AI. You know, a lot of us are really scared of AI, but reality is, is that we've been working with AI in our consumer lives forever and in our work lives without even right. knowing it. Right. So, you know, it's evolved, but um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a yay for that. Yeah, I do have a question for you is, do you think companies are responsible for upskilling their workforce on AI or do you think it's in the individual's hand or the government's hands? What do you think? I think it's all of the above. I think it's all of the above. I think it's in the employee's best interest to be curious and really be out there, you know, keeping a finger on the pulse of the trends. Um, but it absolutely needs to be a part of a um, an, every organization's learning and development strategy, not just trainings, but also, you know, building in learning in the flow of work for these tools Um, and obviously varies depending on whether you're actually like an AI implementer or you're just a user of AI or you're an employee who is interfacing with more and more systems through their employee experience. Right. So learning how to be how to prompt AI correctly so that you can get the best answers. You know, that's not necessarily a technical skill. That's an every person skill. And I think one thing I do like about this prediction is that it means that people can learn. There's an opportunity for them to take charge and learn rather than be scared that it's going to take everything they have away from them. So very So this one is interesting because the tides are shifting. The prediction was that hybrid work is here to stay. So the focus on when, just as much as where we work, you know, general trends around breaking free from the nine to five. What do you think? 
I am a big, big yes on that one. And um, those who know me know that I get on several soapboxes on this topic. I think it's still a problem of an us versus them. They never want to come to the office. We always want to be in the office and hybrid is the win for everybody. So I actually don't like when people say nobody is happy with a hybrid work structure. Actually, everybody is happy because it implies that the power is in your own hands to get your work done when and where you are most productive and most efficient. A big, big part of that, though, is that depending on your role and the activities of the day, it's not just about you. It's about your contribution to the organization and, you know, making sure that you're meeting client needs and you're meeting all the needs of your job and that you're developing over time, which implies building relationships, which are better done in person. So, you know, two extremes saying remote work, right? Remote work is not hybrid work. And I am a firm believer and I've experienced it a couple of times going into hybrid mm -hmm. um, uh, situations even before the pandemic, that a hybrid working model is the optimal model. And the the, the key here is the freedom of choice, right? Mm -hmm. The freedom of choice is so important and so empowering. And the second you tell people that they need to be in the office, even if they wanted to be in the office every day, they dig their heels in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. You hit on so many points. I was sitting here and I said, it's the freedom and flexibility to make choices for yourself. You're absolutely correct. The relationships, though, and kind of the learning and growing. So the next thing, this trend is hanging out at work without the office. I know that this was, you know, people were really pushing for this during the pandemic, uh, you know, to, to feel connected. So this is just figuring out really how to increase informal conversations, particularly for learning and development. Uh, creating virtual team rooms, leveraging the metaverse. How can we, in a hybrid environment, uh, you know, particularly for the Gen Z workforce that started in this environment, help onboard them to company culture, to relationships, to different career pathways and projects and departments and et cetera, all of that informal L&D. Yeah. So I want to remind us that hybrid is not fully remote. And so mm -hmm. some companies are fully remote and you have to be. So the culture piece is a is a piece that I can go down, you know, a, a long rabbit <laughs> hole around. But in a nutshell, culture needs to be deliberately crafted and the elements of culture need to be need to be deliberately managed through online and offline, in-person and remote synchronous and asynchronous interactions, right? So I am not a believer that culture cannot be developed in a remote only environment. In a hybrid mm -hmm. environment, it's much easier because you are in person sometimes. So what I would say is it's really, really critical for those who have not experienced a, an office, you know, situation yet and are very hesitant to go into an office because we've been productive enough remotely um, to really recognize those intangibles that you've mentioned, right? The apprenticeship model, the mentorship, the relationships. One of my colleagues and friends always uses the term exchange of human energy. Yep. Happens in person, right? And mm -hmm. I was just talking to someone who is in a remote first environment and, you know, having never gone out for a drink with someone on her team because it just doesn't come up in virtual conversations, right? right. So really those, those deep relationships that build trust so that you can work better remotely are really critical. So really being deliberate about what happens in person and what happens remotely um, is just really critical, but it mm -hmm. absolutely can be done. And in my opinion, much better so than all, all in person or all remotely. Yeah, I think getting to meet, I like, I like the term human energy because I think, or even getting to have a cocktail with a coworker and knowing them on a personal level without spilling all the details. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it gives you, when you're collaborating, it gives you a little more flexibility and understanding of how each of you think and, and, and are, and there's uh, less kind of like, if there's guessing and gaps in what you understand about a person, our brains fill in with probably the most negative thing that we can think of. So having those relationships, having that intangible human energy uh, 
deepens the connection needed to enjoy your work and to create good work together, right? Yeah, absolutely. I was just um, with my business partner yesterday in a strategic planning session. We hardly, even before the pandemic, we hardly ever met in person, mm. but just that being together in person for four hours created such a boost that enables better collaboration, synchronous and asynchronous while right. we are majority remote, right? So yeah. again, really being deliberate about what makes most sense when you're in person. And it's a trial and error game and you're gonna make mistakes and you're mm -hmm. gonna have meetings where you're like, mm, that would have been better suited in person. But that's the point that empowers employees to feel it and to right. make their own decision whether they should be in the office or not. Exactly. And I also like how you pointed out the intention behind what happens in remote and what happens in person. And that's one way to succeed with the hybrid work policies is if, you're, if your team is coming into the office, knowing what to prioritize, which projects and interactions to prioritize tasks, because you have the opportunity to work in person. Yes, right? absolutely. So the last one that I find interesting is squeezed by competing leader and employee expectations, middle management needs support. Mm. So the demand of today's working environment have left managers completely out of their depth. They feel pressure from above and below to implement corporate strategy, whether it's hybrid work while also providing a sense of purpose, flexibility, career opportunities, it's a lot. And if yeah. you became a manager during COVID, uh, the playbook that you learned before COVID was all possibly in person, and now you are managing remote and hybrid. So uh, what do you know about you know how we support middle managers that are stuck between the higher ups and the, the employees? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of cracks were revealed during the pandemic because traditionally managers and leaders were just people who were really good at their job and then got promoted as individual contributors to eventually lead teams without recognizing that being an individual contributor is a very different skill set than actually leading a team who does that individual contributor thing, right? Yeah. So being a risk manager is very different than being a chief risk officer, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've revealed some gaps and in our assumptions and added to the plate are all of these things going on in the workplace, right? Like you mentioned, hybrid working, we have to pay attention more and more to inclusion. We have to, you know, we have to worry about the well-being of our organizations. We have to worry about upskilling our people while we keep our own skills, you know, in check and evolving at a rapid pace. Um, so there's all these different right. things that are falling on middle managers, um, you know, we at Future Forward talk a lot about the concept of human centered leadership. So really focusing on the human so that they can focus on the work and both sides are important, right? It's not just focusing on the humans, period. It's focusing on the humans so that they can better deliver the business, right? Okay. So really thinking about those two sides, how do we enable middle managers to not be an expert in mental health, because that's not that's not realistic, right? But to actually treat their teams um, and develop themselves in a way that is humble and vulnerable and also, um, you know, gives a sense of, of confidence as well. So mm -hmm. it's a really hard time to be a leader. And I think, like I said at the beginning, um, it, it's, it's not just people who are great at their jobs that end up in leadership role. Like that can't be the model anymore. It's a totally different right. skill set and we really have to focus on how to develop those skills. And it's not just in a one-off training session. I mean, it's an analogous situation. Uh, I'm a big football fan, so American football. So like, you're not gonna take any running back and make them the head coach, right? right? Yeah. Just because, or the offensive coordinator, just because they're a great running back. There's skills that you need to learn around uh, coaching. Like you're really good at your th your the thing you do. Can you teach others how to do it and and encourage them to build their skill set? Um, can you uh, also you know talk to them about their future and how they're developing and identify their strengths and and help them uh, find the best fit uh, projects for them? All of these things uh, you don't learn until you're elevated to become a manager, right? Cool. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So we're going to move on to our second segment. Uh, 
speaking of mental health, we'll get there in a second. So from disruptive to disastrous. So in this segment, my guests and I talk about when technology kind of backfires. Personally, Naomi, it blows my mind that despite all of the technological advancements of the past 20, 30 years, those advancements have not resulted in economic indicators of productivity going mm -hmm. up. And I like to ask, why? Mm -hmm. So today I'm going to kick off with a quick dis disruptive to disastrous story. And then I kind of want to talk about, you know, what happens to a company like this um, in, in, in an enterprise. So BetterUp is an example of an HR tool that was labeled a unicorn, but from my understanding is now on the downslope. So BetterUp founded in 2014, they offer virtual coaching at scale. So you can imagine during the pandemic that became an extremely desirable tool. So in 2021, they raised $300 million series E at a close to $5 billion valuation. So astronomical. And uh, what they do is they use an AI matching algorithm to match each employee with three potential coaches. And then the employees meant to uh, pick one of those coaches to work with over some time period. What I've learned in my research, both from uh, you know secondary market research, as well as talking to people that have used this platform is that the algorithm leaves a lot of employees stuck with three suggested coaches that are all unappealing to the employee themselves. And then the company better up lacks the customer support to help the employees get new matches, right? So we're missing out on a lot of the ROI uh, for investing in a tool like this. Uh, and, you know, we're actually, um, I'm gonna skip that thought. We're going to keep going. So Naomi, how does a company like this grow to that valuation amongst venture investors, but then have fatal flaws? Yeah, so I can comment on just the process and what I'm seeing as kind of some gaps in the process and in the offering. 100%. I can't, I can't comment on the venture side of things, but sure. um, I'm hearing, so it's it, it doesn't sound like it's about the technology or the algorithm. If you think about coaches, that is a very, very personal thing, right? Mm -hmm. So coaching and fit with coaching, just like fit with mentors is a very personal thing that can't necessarily be quantified by AI, right? So it's not the AI and the algorithm that's doing a bad job. It's not the technology that's doing the bad job. It's it's the subjectivity that's still in human processes, in human humans, right? Like mm -hmm. these coaches are human, they're not robots. Right. Um, so you could end up with three people that are not a great fit. So what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing is, what's the screening process to get coaches into better up, right? Mm -hmm. And what are the questions that we're asking coaches to fill out when they uh, submit their profile on better up, which I have not done, so I don't know the answers. Um, and then on the backside, what's the process, like you said, the customer service or the customer success piece that if there's, if there's a pattern of we're not getting the right fit for the right people, then what's the process that fixes that, right? So it right. sounds like there's a great technology platform in in play but very very important is the human element that complements that yeah um so you know i you know i've been in hr for you know way too many years and so you always want coaching for everyone right like you when i first started it was like a remedial thing that you gave executives who are failing right and then it turned into no we're actually giving you know executive coaches to people who we want in our pipeline and our succession plans right. and then it's like well why do we only give it to them back to the middle managers like why can't we have coaching for everybody and have a more democ democratized process which is a great idea but I still think it's in its nascent phases and there's all these human elements that need to be incorporated as well. So I think a, yeah. a broader learning 
is technology tools are amazing and can be amazing enablers of an amazing, that was a lot of amazing, um, of a great customer experience, but without the human discernment, both in terms of asking the right questions and the curiosity in terms of building processes um, and the communication strategy to deploy the technology um, and the back end support, both at the vendor and internally at the company, mm -hmm. then the technology platform you know, is set up to fail. Yeah, you know, I do think, of course, that it's highly uh, presumptuous and brave and audacious to believe that you can deploy an AI algorithm to match two people and there be a productive relationship there. So fundamentally, the strategy and the entire hypothesis this business was based on kind of sets the technology up in a way to fail, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're not well, thinking about in couples, right? Like yeah. imagine saying, imagine guaranteeing, like, I'm going to present you with three people, one of which you're for sure going to marry. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, um, so one kind of like the, uh, the the fundamental assumption that BetterUp is built upon is false, right? The, that this algorithm can match two people and it be successful. Um, and in the way that is like the technology showing with artificial intelligence, like what it it can do really well and what it can't do really well. And it's when it comes to subjectivity, human subjectivity, it's still very much in its infancy. Mm -hmm. I heard yeah. someone once describe AI like right now it's a child right. um, yeah. and we need to mature it into an adult. And, and some of the other guests I've talked to and you alluded to this too at the beginning is, and, and it has to do with AI not necessarily taking our jobs, but people using AI will, is that AI still requires a human intermediary. So it was also a bad game plan for BetterUp to think that they could deploy this AI out matching algorithm without providing an exit door for employees that hit a dead end. When I put my mm -hmm. product management hat on, I think, man, like, couldn't they see from their analytics that there's a bunch of employees that entered in and never had one phone call or had three phone calls and never engaged on a learning journey with any of these coaches? And they should be able to see that right away and, and fix that. But, uh, you know, I've performed due diligence on companies that are competing with them, uh, competing up with BetterUp, and I've talked to customers that have used it and, and it's just not the case, they're not doing it. And that's where I think a lot of B2B SaaS companies that are venture funded get it wrong because uh, venture investors turn their nose up at customer support and customer service, mm -hmm. but it's so important, uh, especially to get to, to ensure the success of a platform like this. And I believe the comment I was going to say before is that measuring the success of, of coaching can be quite difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Measuring the outcomes and the impact of, of a coaching um, remediation is really quite difficult. So uh, in absence of that, seeing that employees are not using the service at all makes it look like a bad, bad idea. Yeah. And there's also accountability internally at the company, right? So who owns the relationship with BetterUp? Who owns that vendor management? Who owns the analytics, right? Because it's not all on BetterUp. It's also on, you know, usually falls within the learning and development team or whatever the case is to really keep a finger on the pulse. To your point, not just people who like, just like a training, right? Not just people who open the training, not just people who complete the training, but what is the outcomes of that training, which is very, very difficult to measure. It, it leads to, you know, what the, what's the behavior change as a result of that engagement, mm -hmm. right? So if you're not even getting the bare bones metrics, you should be able to see that right up front and have an intervention with BetterUp or whoever yeah. your partner is to do something different. Yeah. Usage is the bare bone metric. And that's what I advise early stage startups is like the only thing you really should be measuring is are people using the product at the frequency that they that you want them to use. So at the bare bones, BetterUp needs to show that employees are using their product. And yeah. right now, uh, a lot are not. Uh, to your point around accountability issues, kind of who owns 
HR technology and HR analytics and insights and, and judging the quality of an HR technology platform? Like who owns that within most companies? Yeah, it's a big, big question right now. Um, so, you know, clearly the skill set of the actual tech and data and requirements and all that sits with the tech requirements sits within technology, right? But the subject matter expertise sits within HR. Mm -hmm. And HR has not typically been a very analytical, uh, that hasn't been the skill set that most HR silos or most HR COEs have been trained to do or have had in their background, had in their education, right? So it's this debate of who owns the vendor relationship, who owns the actual technology implementation, and who owns the content within that technology. Right. Um, and, and it gets very political, right? It leads to who has the budget and who's allowed to make decisions on what and all that stuff. So I don't have a perfect answer. Um, it's just, uh, it's something that's evolving. I mean, ultimately HR professionals, maybe those that are graduating out of HR analytics programs now, um, come in with a more robust skill set around analytics and data and are more comfortable with the tools that we need to use. But the actual technology implementation needs to sit within a, a queue that really is within the technology team. So it's really, right. a, you know, there's accountability all over the place. I think the key is really to define what the accountabilities are and revisit those on a, on a regular basis, depending on the maturity of that, of that system. Right? right. So, you know, if you look at a workday, for example, a lot of organizations were going through implementing workday, which is, you know, not in the sweet spot skill set of pause for a second. Workday yeah. is a human resources information system. Would you say that? Is that what it's called? Okay. So yeah. we're, and it's a very popular one. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the implementation of Workday, right? Like a lot of the skill set to do with implementation probably sits within technology, but the business requirements sit within HR. And then the technology requirements kind of blur between HR and technology, right? Because how does that system then, you know, fold into some of the, or talk to some of the other systems that don't sit within HR, right? The right. complicated thing right now is that employee experience is is very broad and doesn't fully sit within hr yeah. so it's a big debate and back to my point i think it's just really important to clarify those accountabilities and revise them as our teams mature as our technologies mature um etc well you brought us right into our final segment the deep dive so in this segment we get into the details about a specific technologies implications for everyday people. Today, I really want to talk about enterprise software systems and the role they play in the employee experience because it's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, why is this important to me and everyone that's listening? One part of my background is in service system design. I've always understood that a company must treat their employees the way they want their employees to treat their customers. It's a system of cause and effect, and it goes yeah. through a bunch of nodes in a network. So it's baffling that it seems to be such a novel point to some, because this is a point that I was researching in graduate school 20 years ago. So why mm. is it that the idea that a company's employee experience affects their customer experience outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more than one affects the other. I think they have to be very aligned, right? And they have to ladder up to a broader purpose, right? So mm -hmm. I'll start at even more macro level. If your purpose has something to do with service, or excellence, or seamlessness, or speed, or if that is your customer value proposition, you better make sure you're doing the very same things with your employees, right? And that might look like value statements that match to value statements, however you want to align those two. But if you're a technology servicing company, for this is a very simple example, and your onboarding process for your employees is terrible, and they don't have their computer until day seven, and they don't know where to go to get anything done, then all of a sudden that erodes trust, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, the holy grail in all companies today is building trust. If you don't have the trust of your employees, everything falls, right? Everything right. else falls. Um, and we have things like quiet quitting and the great resignation and all the trends that we've been seeing, right? So it's very disingenuous to have this customer value proposition 
that does not match with the employee value proposition. And in my opinion, it's actually the easiest place to start, right? So if your number one value for your customers is, um, is well-being, right? You yeah. better be prioritizing well-being with your with your employees. They better not be working till all hours of the night and complaining that they're burnt out and not having any time to see their kids or whatever the case is, right? So really focusing on like, what is that number one thing we cannot mess up with our customers and making sure that that is with our employees as well is critical, is table stakes. And to your point, a lot of a lot of organizations see them as entirely different things because one sits within HR and one sits within marketing or strategy or sales or whatever the case is, right? Yeah. So really that systemic approach to things like that um, are just so critical. And you know, the second, and also your employees are your customers, right? So if you're like a grocery chain and you're shopping and you happen to work at that grocery chain, you're seeing, right? Like you're seeing the customer experience and you're experiencing the employee experience all at the same time. So it's very confusing. And again, erodes trust if those things don't align. 100%. And to your example of, you know, I, I was onboarded into this company in a very terrible, discombobulated way. And my job is now to onboard customers and uh well you didn't onboard me well so i really don't actually know how you want me to onboard these customers right <laughs> and yeah. i have to, to make it up or spend yeah. 45 minutes like making the customer wait so i can go ask these other questions and it becomes you know an awful experience and that's like literally how employee experience affects customer experience yeah absolutely or you are resentful because you're like this is how i'm supposed to onboard the customer but i was not onboarded any way shape or form like this right yeah, right um, expectations are changing i mean they've been changing for the past 10 years we no longer tolerate a employee grade experience right we want a customer grade experience at work because it's 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 become more and more seamless when we are an employee and when we are a customer so mm -hmm. we, we really have to make sure that you know yes from a technology and seamlessness perspective of course but also from a values perspective that those two things line up mm -hmm. so i want to touch on something that from the last segment we talked about accountability and who owns what so historically enterprise software was acquired in silos, accounting software, marketing software, sales software, financial software. And I, there was a, a, an amazing paper uh, I, I read back in 2006, 2007, that was about, you know, staple yourself to an order. So like go into a company and watch as like a new customer moves through the organization and how many different pieces of software they, their data and information needs to go into and how many times something is literally just thrown over the wall mm -hmm. to the like next department because software systems don't integrate. Like, and you said with the example with Workday, like they, if Workday doesn't integrate with XYZ platform or that platform's owned by a department that doesn't want to sacrifice their own experience for a more, you know, broader employee experience, um, this affects people in their every day because they're subjected to like onerous and inefficient processes. They're entering data from one system to another, right? Yeah. Why do you think that keeps happening over and over and over again? Yeah, I mean, I think things have progressed. I do. Like, I think back in the day, you couldn't have any plugins to any of your systems. So you had to buy, and, and I'm not a technology person, but you had to buy, uh, you know, a, an Oracle or an SAP or, you know, a really big system. And you had to kind of hope that they had all the functionalities you needed because nothing really talked to those systems. Mm -hmm. Now, more and more, there are kind of, there is kind of a Lego approach where you can bolt on different systems and they relatively smoothly talk to one another within a silo though right so to your point about the onboarding part right like if technology is not on board with plugging in whatever whatever ticketing system they have into the hris i don't when i go in as an employee and i log a ticket i don't care if it's a technology or a hr problem or a payroll problem i don't care where it sits in the organization i just want it solved right. and the amount of like 
scotch tape band-aids that exist in the background. I don't really care. I just want my paycheck or I want my computer, right? right? So I think it's getting there. I think we're evolving. I just think it's where we are in the state of technology today. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist on that front that things will get better if we focus on it and if we have the right cross-functional alignment and incentives, by the way. So if I'm not incented to talk to the technology department in order to do my job, I'm gonna try to recreate things on my end that it, it's not it's not good for the organization and the enterprise right. level. I was gonna ask you where you're most optimistic. You shared that tech and data can be game-changing yes. enablers for employee experience. So maybe you can share where you are most optimistic. Yeah, I, again, I think we're at a very, we're at a very big crossroads, right? Like we're at a very big um, turning point right now where we have all these bright, shiny objects and we're gonna, we need to figure out how to integrate them into a seamless employee experience, considering AI, but not AI for AI's sake, not AI because it's cool and because I can ask ChatGPT to do this and look what it does, right? But really, I think we're, we're, to your point, at the very nascent stages of a lot of these technologies and also how they all talk to one another and how they seamlessly integrate, which, by the way, is much better now, like I said, than 20 years ago when I entered the workforce. So yeah. I am optimistic about that. And I do, I am very optimistic about the power of kind of taking the robot out of the humans so that the humans can do what they do best, right? So I really like am that. a firm believer in technology, but not just for technology's sake and in partnership with humans. Yeah. I think one of the reasons that uh, some employees in some organizations are still facing frustrations that existed 20 years ago that I anticipated might be gone is that sometimes the companies or the leaders that are acquiring these software systems, they're acquiring them without really considering the people part of the problem mm -hmm. that they're looking to solve or the business process they're looking to support. Uh, for instance, you see it a lot with, you know, in the conversation around AI, in the conversation this year, given a lot of layoffs, um, they acquire new software for efficiency gains while swiftly reducing headcount only to learn that uh, they're not getting those efficiency gains uh, and now their workforce that they still have is totally burnt out. So, no. uh, so I guess, you know, how do we, is there an opportunity to change that style of thinking? I, I sometimes get a little pessimistic and think it's just, or realist. It's the ego, it's the human ego, right? And unless everyone is like meditating, you know, a half an hour a day uh, before they make these big technology decisions, <laughs> right? <laughs> like uh, it's going to be really hard to, you know, uh, uh, stop these types of decisions that to, to me as an outsider seem kind of foolish because they keep happening over and over again. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head in that like the change management and I, I don't even like the words change management anymore because it's just the change management aspect of these implementations are always deprioritized, right? And that's the first place for resources to be cut in HR teams and change management teams. Let's implement Workday and we're going to espouse to leader self-service, but we're not actually going to have enough support for leaders who have no idea how to use these systems and it's not part of their day job, right? So how do you create an environment where these tools are in the flow of work, right? Buttons are in the right place at the right time in their flow of work and, um, and they know how to use those things because only then can you reduce the headcount in in, you know, in, in traditionally kind of admin type roles because mm -hmm. they actually are self-sufficient, right? Like we, we assume they're self-sufficient and then cut a bunch of heads and then there's nobody to support them. And the HR teams are like beyond burnt out, beyond. Yeah. One, um, of my, yeah. one of my favorite stories is that I was hired as a consultant on a small project. So a large fortune 50 company, 
has a new CTO come in and they want, or CIO, and they want to change out the digital asset management system, despite their existing system only being in use for a year and a half. Uh, they go hire some very large research firm to start collecting requirements for the new digital asset management system, spend like half a million or something on that project. And they put them aside about 50 grand for the consulting company that hired me to interview right. about like 20 employees to figure out why the existing system isn't meeting their needs. And right. the re resounding feedback was, no one taught us how to use it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and uh, and it, there were some smaller groups within that company that were using other systems because they had recently been acquired. And they were like, oh yeah, we just have someone dedicate five hours a month to delivering ongoing training to learn how to use our system. It's like, yeah. wow. So this company had, in launching the existing digital asset management system, had employees spending the past two years transferring from the old system to this system. And they're about to rip that system out and put a brand new one in and spending, let's say that half a million, when for 20% of that, they could have just hired a full-time like trainer yeah. Yeah. to just teach everyone how to use this, this system that they have because that system meets actually meets the company's needs. Yeah. And it's not even just training though. It's also building those in the flow help interventions, right? Whether it be, I love personally in the technologies that I use, I love the, the community aspect, right? Like I love being able to go to the community and asking, it's almost like your phone a friend network, right? Mm -hmm. So also believing that I can train people once and they've got it and they're good to go. And then we can, you know, let go of a bunch of HR people is it's silly to your point. You end up spending a lot more money on the back end because everyone complains that that system is the problem when it's not the system that's the problem. It's actually the change management, the onboarding, the continuous development, because you're building new skills when you're yeah. learning, you know, yeah. when you're learning the system. Yeah. yeah. It's just another place where, and it, you know, I used to think that it was just engineers that avoided the hard people part, but it is across the board, whether you're a technical person or not, we like to just throw solutions at a problem and hope that, you know, it, it, it solves it and avoid the people part because it's hard, it's subjective, it's difficult to measure, capture, and, uh, you know, let it go. And it, I think that's, to be honest, one of the big reasons why a lot of companies like or the broad economic indicators for productivity haven't increased because each new computer system we acquire in this way that I previously described creates a whole new set of problems that need to be remediated. Yeah, I mean, I think it's your point. I think people blame the technology when it's really not the technology that's the problem. Like even if you're better up, it's, well, it's not better up. That's the problem. It's the yeah. process around it, right? Like you can't just throw a technology at people and expect it to solve, you know, world hunger. It just doesn't yeah. work that way. I remember very early on my first full time job, uh, I had an opportunity to go talk to our primary client and i he's a manager and i was asking him about how his organization worked and and they said well can i talk to some of your employees because they're the ones that are going to be using this software and he was like oh that's not necessary they will use this software because it's their job mm -hmm. yeah and that they project may, they're not very efficient at it and they might yeah. not be very <laughs> Aged, right. And to tell you the truth, I've heard stories of people having such a terrible technology experience that they decided to leave the company. Of right? course. Like, real thing. Because 100%. You do all, especially in this day and age, it's what you're experiencing all day, every day. Right. right. And when you're ready to pull your hair out and you can't write what, what you need to write or do what you need to do because the technology is so terrible and the experience is so terrible. You know, you end up leaving to go somewhere where yeah. the experience is better. So let's make it make sense and and turn the frown upside down you know if someone here is working within an organization and their technology experience is is 
tough on them? You know, how can they understand it? And then how can they work with it? What could they do to, 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 uh, yeah, make things better for themselves and the people around them? Yeah. I mean, if they're not an engineer and they're not going to fix the actual technology themselves, I love this trend of generating self-generated content. So if, there's like a Teams platform or there's like a central SharePoint site, you could start a trend of just, I had a really hard time with this. This is how I fixed it, right? And, right. and, and that's a great culture changer also, right? Because it's the learning culture, it's a collaboration culture. Um, so that's one thing that you could do. You could always obviously kind of send it up the chain and, and voice concern around it. But unless you're, you know, very technologically savvy, um, I'd say, you know, sharing wins is, is a great way yeah. to, to overcome that. I think also sharing wins and sharing feedback, to be honest, a lot of, um, a lot of the decision makers and a lot of the people responsible for managing, they don't always hear from, uh, the users, what the, the problems are, or, or, you know, if there's a bug, then IT support is, is contacted. But, uh, you know, I think some of the people I talked to in the better up example, like they didn't say anything. They're just like, oh, I'm just not going to use this benefit. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Which is probably often the case, unless you're in a culture that asks for feedback on a regular right. basis. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much, Naomi. I want to thank all of you for listening to Make Sense with me, your host, Lindsay Tabus, and my guest, Naomi Teitelman, talent strategist and award-winning HR exec. We hope you enjoyed our take on HR tech. Naomi, where can people find you online? Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. That's my primary channel. Uh, also sign up for our newsletter, Foresight, as well as listen to our podcast, which is also called Foresight. So the podcast yeah. is you can find it anywhere you listen to your podcasts and the foresight newsletter you can get at our website futureforward.com future forward f-o-h-r-w-a-r-d.com yep so as always you can check out all the links and resources in the show notes Final note, if you want to continue to be the smartest person in the room, make sure you're getting notified when each episode hits on YouTube. Hit that subscribe for next week's episodes and for audio only follow wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, Naomi, for joining me today. Thank you for having me.